Hello, everybody. We are back with, with with the Aviation Spotters podcast. That's right. I'm your host, Colin Moser, and we are back. This is not season three. I took a little spring break hiatus. I had to take a little break from the show. I had a really awesome time with my amazing girlfriend in Charleston, South Carolina, for a really nice week. And I also did go out to shoot jets in the wild with the king of the desert himself, Chris McGreevy. Yes, I interviewed him while we were on location shooting jets with him. So hopefully we were able to get a time where we can sit down and do a full-length interview. But uh, we recorded a really cool segment on location with with Chris. But um, anyway, guys, it's great to be back with you. Great being able to do this again. Um, I hope you guys thoroughly enjoyed Lauren's episode about her experience in the back of a KC-135. And I, I, I really took to the p8 story that she told of her making the first contact with the p8 poseidon you know we see a lot of p8s here in boise and i honestly thought that was so cool that she was one of the first people to ever do an aerial refuel with the with the p8 um but if you guys have any questions about anything please please reach out to her she is an amazing woman and i really couldn't thank her enough especially for taking the time out of her schedule to come on the show and talk a little aviation with me, even though she's not necessarily a spotter. But I hope you guys went to go follow her because you are not going to be disappointed. So anyway, guys, with that being said, we're back to episode 22. And what's really funny is we actually mentioned this guest before. So if you go back to episode 6 with Nick Moore, he tells a little story about how he came to Nell's the day after I did but he is with his friend named Ryan. Well, truth be told, I met Ryan the day before, and now he's on the show. So it's my pleasure to introduce from Easton, Pennsylvania, or as he will say, Allentown, Pennsylvania, because nobody knows where Easton is, apparently, unless you live in the area. So from small town, Pennsylvania, it's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Ryan Kelly. Ryan, good evening. How are you? Good evening, Colin. Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Of course, dude. Um, yeah, it's it's so funny how we recorded with Nick, and he's like, oh, yeah, I met up with Nick. And I was like, oh, well, I could have seen you, and I just met him the day prior. So, <laughs> Yeah, that was that was a fun trip. <clears throat> yeah, that was. That was a really good show, too. That was like the last big air show I think everybody went to also. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was my first time at Nellis uh, for their show, and... Man, it was good. <laughs> it was good. It was good, but yeah. But what sucked was the Thunderbirds demo when there's no wind and all the smoke that they did became stagnant. Do you remember that? Yeah, it almost got to a point. I mean, I think on the solo crosses where it just didn't even make sense to pull up the camera because you couldn't even see the jets. Yeah, everybody stopped shooting. We're all going, "What the hell is this?" <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, thanks for coming on again. I, I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule, and I hope the listener is going to get uh, is going to get a really good sense of who you are. And I know you have some amazing stories to tell, so let's get into it. Awesome, let's go. All right, man. So let's get to know you a little bit. So where are you from? How you got into aviation? How you got into photography? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'll start from the beginning. Um, I originally am a Jersey boy, so I grew up in Jersey. Uh, most of my family still lives there. Um, got into aviation when I was super young. I was about four years, three or four years old. My dad took me to a, an air show at uh, McGuire Air Force Base, and the Blue Angels happened to be there. So, and brand new to airplanes, aviation. Um, my dad was a 135 driver. Uh, a models and uh, so he naturally had a love for aviation and passed the bug on to me and I just remember being at the show and he's seeing all the jets on the ground back when they had you know C-141s and uh, some of the uh, F-14s and F-4s still on the ramp there and uh, it, it stuck with me all these years uh, paid for my first uh, flying lesson if you will I think it was $15 to hop in a 152 and take one or two passes around the pattern at the local airport that uh, my brother got his pilot's license at and uh, it's just stuck with me ever since uh, got my pilot's license shortly after graduating high school before I went off to college and uh, did a little bit of flying during college and a little bit after college and that's actually what kind of got me into photography. Uh, during college, I had a little 
point and shoot Nikon cool pics camera and went to sign fun and thought I was the coolest thing since sliced bread. And then the guy next to me is pulling out a 500, 600 millimeter prime and there I am with a point and shoot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I started to get a little low on cash and I was like, you know what, like maybe, maybe I'll put flying on hold for a little bit till the uh, income starts coming in. And then I start thinking, you know, if I can't actually fly the airplanes, let me at least document them. Let me at least take pictures of them, you know, make, maybe do like a hobby on the side, just have some fun with it. Uh, bought a DSLR, didn't know what the heck I was doing, shot on auto for, God, the first like several months I had the thing. Uh, mm -hmm. I had 70 to 300 lens and an 18 to 15, 18 to 55 came with the, uh, the camera body and uh, kind of stuck with it, got tips, good tips, bad tips, what to do, what not to do. A lot of the stuff that I do has been self-taught and just trying to gain some creativity and be a little bit different. Uh, one of the uh, my fellow full disc brothers always said that uh, dare to be different and I'm sealing that one from Zulu X-ray Photography. Rich, I, that one always stuck with me. Uh, never be afraid to get creative and have some fun with it. So that's the long and short of it. Um, that's a little bit about me, though. Running a 152 for fifteen dollars. I mean, holy crap, <laughs> dude! That's <laughs> man. Yeah, it was fun, and and I I still remember the end number on the airplane too. So, uh, well, I still remember my 152, uh, November four nine or eight one eight. Yep, yeah, I was in six three four one Papa. So <laughs> it's the the airplane. People don't realize that I think the aircraft you have your first big aviation milestones in you'll never ever forget the aircraft absolutely no i agree it's it's like one of those those first love and uh i did also forget to mention at the beginning you are a member of the full disc aviation team that has brought some amazing work to the aviation field as well i am like i said you know i probably mentioned this in nick's episode but i was at star wars canyon in 2019 and that's where i got introduced to fda and i met uh, james and nick uh their first trip out to the low level I was actually supposed so. to go on that trip. Uh, yeah. Oh, no way, really? Yeah, I, I was contemplating it back and forth for a month or two, and they said, hey, we're thinking about going out there. Um, I was going to buy my plane tickets, and like, you know, something just doesn't sit right. So for personal reasons, I said, I'm not going to go. I don't, I don't think it's a good move to go. And uh, some just went with a gut feeling, and the gut feeling in this case was actually wrong. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I missed out on an incredible trip, but I mean, the shots that they got out there uh, and just the incredible time that they had, it looked like a blast. I'm happy that they were able to go out there and have a great time and uh, just get to hang out, shoot some jets, shoot some stars, and get to meet some cool people. You did dodge the weather, though. The weather wasn't that great, but it's really funny that I actually inadvertently ran into them the night before we all went out there at the canyon and we were in the parking lot at Father Crowell and we got some epic star shots mm -hmm. and we we didn't know about it until after the fact obviously but <laughs> um, so quick question your dad flew the KC-135A mm -hmm. so was he a combat veteran did he fly in Vietnam or uh, any other no uh, so he flew uh, for a few years um, I want to say late 70s early 80s uh, he was, uh, then he's transitioned over to the Air Force Reserves and uh, he had the reservist and then he also had the uh, civilian life. He had a, uh, you know, nine to five suit and tie job as well. Um, he did a bunch of stuff throughout the Air Force, whether it be uh, through logistics. He was an aerial port commander as well at McGuire, uh, 30 years, two tours in, uh, in Iraq. And uh, one of my role models, certainly to this day. Um, but yeah, yeah, he flew the A model, so and he, he always jokes about the water injection, and uh, he's like, yeah, if it said we had an 11,000-foot runway, we used about 10,000 feet, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, B-52 also uses water injection, too, so. Yeah. For now. For now. Uh, well, okay, so you're from New Jersey, mm -hmm. you near McGuire Air Force Base and, and all that sort of stuff, so what, do you cons what, what would you consider your home airport, though? Um, so... I grew up in Northwest Jersey, and a lot of people think that New Jersey is uh, they'll fly into like Newark, and they just see the crowded streets and they see the city life. Uh, parts of New Jersey are absolutely stunningly beautiful. Rolling hills, uh, the colors, especially in the fall. Uh, 
There's a very small runway in Pittstown, New Jersey called Skyman Airport. Its designator is November 40. That what I would say would say that would be my home airport. That's where I uh, really got serious about flying. That's where I earned my private ticket. I uh, made a lot of friendships when I came to the aviation community there in New Jersey. Uh, I was part of the EAA chapter there for a long time. Um, but yeah, November 40 would definitely be it. Plus there's a really good restaurant there. Can't be the $100 burger. Absolutely not. So what else do you have outside of uh, photography that uh, you enjoy doing? Uh, well, my one of the reasons I moved to Pennsylvania is uh, my beautiful wife. Uh, she grew up about 20 minutes from where we reside now. And uh, so I made the move out here and, you know, we like to you know, go around before COVID. Uh, we like to go to different places around uh, the, the area here, Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton. Lots of cool stuff to do, keep you busy, uh, whether it be checking out uh, new breweries, new restaurants, or new coffee shops, stuff like that. Uh, we have a is he two, uh, two and a half year old, uh, I, I joke, I say he's a pure mutt, uh, but he's mainly a, he's a hound and lab mix uh, dog. So uh, we stay busy. Um, when I'm not taking pictures of airplanes, uh, I'm, I'm working Monday through Friday, but uh, well, I, I recently got back into playing drums. So when it's too cold outside to go pick up the camera, I'll pick up the sticks and hit the drums, hit the cymbals a little bit. Awesome. Metal, metal head at all? Uh, mainly rock and metal. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Can't go wrong with that. Plus, you know, a little stress relief too playing the drums, right? Oh, 150%. <laughs> <laughs> So when you miss that one, that one thing at the airport or whatever it is, then you go back and beat some drums, and we call it good. Well, it's funny. They, uh, I, I, my commute is about forty minutes, and and I f pass a international airport. I pass we have Valley International Airport, and uh, man, I got to start bringing my camera with me because I'll be driving home, and there might be a C seventeen or a C one thirty that's practicing approaches. And by the time I would get home, get my camera and be back, it's either going to be dark or they're going to be gone. So, oh. um, yeah, so that's that's definitely something I'm going to have to keep doing now is, is keeping the camera in the back of the car. Speaking of cameras, let's move on to the next question. So you said you started out with the, with the Nikon Cool Picks. So after the Cool Picks, what did you start getting into? Uh, I went with very entry level when it came to, I guess if you want to semi-professional, professional DSLRs, I uh, went with a D3200, uh, 3000 series for Nikon has always had pretty good reviews, uh, good quality, uh, good reliability. Got me really understanding the kind of the functionality of the camera, what made it tick, what, uh, what settings to use for, you know, propeller driven aircraft and uh, got off auto and then experimented with shutter priority, aperture priority, and it was actually the first camera that I taught myself to do manual on. Um, so yeah, D3200 was my flagship for a little bit. All right, so what about currently? Uh, currently, I have two bodies. Um, for full frame, I have a Nikon D750. I know there's been models released since it, but I, I absolutely love uh, my 750. Uh, it gives you everything that you could ever need in a, in a camera. Um, the only bugaboo I have about my D750 is I wish it had the shutter speed of my D500. Uh, that's my mm, yeah. That's my crop sensor. Um, so most of the time for air shows, I'll uh, have the big lens on the D500, and then usually either the 24 to 120 on the 750 or the 70 to 200. My buddy just got a. He has the same setup, uh, but he did. He got an 850, which is an unbelievable camera plus the d500 which is i mean as a canon user um it's argue, arguably one of the best crop bodies on the market mm -hmm. yeah i mean the shutter is smoking after uh, after a good pass oh. <laughs> yeah i mean that's a great it's a great air show camera or just a great like little longer range type photography also but you get the uh what was nikon 70 to 400 even their 400 300 prime on the d the d500 and man let it let it rip tater yeah absolutely a long ways, you know, from a little point shoot cool picks to a full frame and one of the best crop bodies on the market. I mean, that's 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 how a lot of people do start out, and I mean, that's how I started out. Believe it or not, is uh, years and years ago before I really got into it, I used my iPad to record like in-flight videos with. That's okay, man. I I still mount my phone oh, on, yeah. on top of my camera sometimes, and uh, 
you hear the camera clicking away in the video, but you know, it's cool to kind of relive the moment even outside of the photos. Yeah. I mean, actually, you guys can go on YouTube and actually see my iPad videos. And while you're on YouTube, make sure you go subscribe to us, the Aviation Spotters Podcast, on the YouTube page. Last YouTube plug right there. Bam. <laughs> um, um, we all got to start somewhere. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. It's what makes us who yep. we are today. Yep. Kids, you know, kids nowadays, they got their cool smartphones. I mean, granted, we all have cool smartphones now, but, you know, they got that. But we had cool pixes and the Canon equivalent and all that cool stuff. Yeah. So... All right, well, uh, so now we know that you're an icon guy with two awesome bodies. Uh, let's start getting to the aviation specific sure. stuff. Let's, let's talk about airports. Uh, what is your favorite airport to go take photos at? Um, it's actually not even a uh, civilian, uh, believe it or not. It's, uh, I have two. Uh, one is uh, NAS Oceana down in Virginia Beach. Uh, there's a couple of really neat spots. Okay. Uh, it's Master Jet Base. I mean, more Super Hornets than you could ever count. Uh, since they started to phase out some of the legacy Hornets. Uh, I think there's maybe one or two aggressor squadrons left at Oceana that are flying the legacies. Uh, and the other one would, I'd have to say, be Nellis. Um, I know you have the episode on uh, spotting at Nellis and uh, just the pure variety that you can get at Nellis on any given day. You can't beat it. German Tonkas, for instance, right now, as we're recording this in late, late April, you know, <laughs> but we actually talk a lot about Nellis on this show, so let's talk about Oceana. Mm -hmm. We haven't mentioned Oceana a lot, so what makes Oceana so big in the naval world, for the people that don't know? Uh, well, like I said, it's a master jet base. Uh, there's always a lot of traffic there, whether it's transient. I mean, you look at it any given day, uh, they'll have C-17s going in and out of their 130s going in and out of their uh, they'll have P-8s that you know come up from Jacksonville going in and out of their practicing approaches and stuff like that. In addition to uh, all the opera all the squadrons that are flying out of there, um, you know VFA-106, the Rhino demo team on the East Coast, uh, they're they're actually based out of Oceana as well. Uh, I think one of the most unique things about Oceana is that for the most part, it's, it's a it's a welcoming base for spotters. Um, you know, as long as you, same, same kind of rules as Nellis, you know, stay on the other side of the road. Um, you know, don't do anything suspicious. Don't argue with the police or anything like that. And they'll leave you alone. You can get some really unique angles, um, uh, on a lot of the aircraft that are, you know, either arriving or departing out of there. I mean, there's four runways at Oceana, uh, north, uh, north, south oriented and east, west oriented. So uh, <laughs> take a <your> pick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's insane. You know, at least they got all their their winds covered. I mean, being on the ocean, I'm assuming you know winds can shift pretty drastically. But that's interesting. How it's a spotter friendly base. You know, you compare that to Lemoore, which is the other master base for the super for the Hornet. You know, like like Lemoore and Fallon are both extremely uptight about photographers. There, they don't they're not welcoming two photographers at all that much, mm -hmm. which is which is interesting. Like a lot of the West Coast naval bases are 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 more uptight about their security and stuff like that. And um, when I was on my trip with Chris McGreevy, like we mentioned earlier, um, China Lake sits on a lot of native land, and there are, are old pictographs which haven't been touched because the Navy owns the land. So he said like the Navy will occasionally bring people out to go tour these pic the pictographs on the the cave walls and stuff like that. That's on base property but they bring you on base they have you can't take a camera out or phone out to the location and they put you on a bus with like no windows so you can't see anything or where you're going wow <laughs> yeah it's kind of intimidating <laughs> i mean cool i would love to go see that stuff but man at the same time i'll, I'll hear something flow i'll be like what is that what is it carrying it's a vx squadron it's something new you know mm -hmm. a nerd out completely nerd out <laughs> Can't forget about El Centro either. Oh yeah, yeah. El C I've never done the photo call at El Centro. Have you? I have not. I, uh, you know, I, that's that's another one of those that maybe I should do it. Maybe I, and then COVID hit, and then it was well, we're not doing it. And then I think they had one over the winter, but it was something like you could. They were only doing it for X amount of people, and you had to live within so many miles of it. So I mean, there were definitely restrictions in place because of COVID on on it, and. Um, 
you know, even even being off base at El Centro, uh, especially when the Blues are practicing there in the winter. I mean, if you haven't gone out there for any spotter, take a couple of days and just go. Um, oh yeah. And it's better to go during the week because they don't. I don't think they practice at all on Sundays. Um, but just take a couple of days off work, make a trip out there. Um, it's 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 great for Jets, and there's a lot of variety out there too. Yeah. Oh yeah, you can't go wrong with El Centro. There's always stuff going on out there because mm-hmm. it's just so it's in location. Like you got North Island, Yuma, um, Labor, just everything right there. Oh yeah. But well, speaking of aircraft, what is your favorite aircraft to just spot? I've always had a soft spot in my heart on the turbine side for just legacy Hornets. Uh, that was the first jet I really loved. Um, just something about it just looked kick ass um so i'd say the hornet and then on a little go on the warbird side i gotta go with the mustang nothing against any other warbird or anything but i've always loved the mustang as most people have but there's something about a mustang that just you know whether you see it whether you hear it you just smile yeah it's it's one of those aircraft where you just stop listen and to stop when you know you just take a pause. We have Mark Peterson owns two of them at the Boise Airport. So when I'm at work, I see it taxiing by and then it takes off. I just stop for a second and just enjoy the noise because unfortunately, these planes are getting a lot more expensive to fly. And the Mustang will probably be the, one of the last ones flying that are able to fly because there's just so, there, there are still parts for them. You know, people are still manufacturing stuff for the Merlin and just it's it's a it's a very flown aircraft. <laughs> but one day it's going to be grounded. There's only so much stuff that they can do to these aircraft to keep them airworthy forever. Right. So, but I, Mustangs, I love. And at the Warbird Roundup, the last one in 2019, they had every variant of the P-51 from A to H. Mm. Except the twin Mustang, obviously, but, and the turbo, and the turbo prop Mustang. Yeah, I have mixed feelings on the, the twin Mustang. <laughs> It's an interesting aircraft. I mean, it was designed as a night interceptor during the Korean War. So, I'm like, what better way than the most dominant fighter of the Second World War? Let's put two of them together. You know? <laughs> <laughs> What's even crazier, it actually saw combat. Yeah. You know? Like, like oh, was, I, we thought it was a prototype, but no, it actually saw combat in Korea. It's crazy. Which is insane. <laughs> Um, speaking, you mentioned Sun and Fun. Were you at that Sun and Fun where they kind of unveiled her to the general public? I wasn't. Uh, I haven't been to Sun and Fun in a few years, actually. I mean, it's one of the shows I want to get back down to just because, you know, I still have, I went to college down in Florida, so I still have friends that live down there, and I think maybe that's on the calendar for next year. Okay. Well, hey, it just happened. The first Manjaro show since 2019. Absolutely. And, and it looks like they had a pretty good turnout. I mean, they definitely had a lot of. Uh, performers and blues did their first public demonstration in this new in the supers so um, i'm happy to see some sense of normalcy starting to kind of come back to the industry yeah and we mentioned the legacy hornets and the super hornets i just i saw a post earlier today that um vsc 12 the, the omars one of the famous navy aggressor squadrons that traditionally have flown the legacy hornet um, I think they're winding down legacy operations, and they just gave some of their birds to VFA 204, the reserve squadron in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. So some of the splintered camos are now at uh, two of the, the, the river rattlers. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, they're good airplanes, and I think up until a few years ago, there were a couple uh, A plus and even B models flying uh, out of Oceana. So. Don't know if they were still there and made their way down south or they're sitting in a desert somewhere. They still might be there. I know, I think we got uh, 2019, we got an A model through the canyon. I was on it in the A or C. I know one guy got on my ass about it. Like, I usually, when I went to the canyon, I kept a list of times and all that because people like that. And this one guy got on my ass about, ooh, it's a C model. You put A model. I'm like, holy crap, I'm so sorry. <laughs> You know, don't 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 get uptight. It's okay. We all make mistakes. And you know what? How could I tell if it's an A or a C while it's flying through? Besides looking at the Buno and the and the coat on the tail. And interestingly enough, uh, up until the retirement from the Blues, they actually flew uh, the 
number five jet was an A model. No way, really. Yeah. One of the last, actually the last time I saw uh, VMFA 314, the Black Knights here in Boise with their Hornets, were, they were all A++ Hornets. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. And actually, I talked to the pilot, and he, they preferred the A++ because it's a lighter airframe, and they still have the avionics in them as the C models do. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. 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 But I, I guess the airframe just got, it just got so old. And it was quite broken too, <laughs> <laughs> but we'll skip we'll skip over that. <laughs> but uh, so this might be the same same thing. But what is your favorite aircraft of all time? Is it the Legacy Hornet still? I think I'll have to go with the Mustang on this one. That's fair, just because it's just that icon. Yeah, I mean, you don't even have to like airplanes or love airplanes. I mean. You have a Mustang fly by a group of people, not even at an air show, I guarantee you every single one of those people will turn around and watch that entire flyby. If not all of them, yeah. 99% of them. And it's 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 up there as like the 747 and the F4 Phantom and Concorde. You know, everybody knows what a 747 is and that's, that's like a Mustang. You don't have to be an aviation guy to know what a Mustang mm -hmm. is. Absolutely. Always a crowd pleaser on that one. Oh, uh, you can't beat the sound of a Merlin. No, not at all. So the Mustang being the favorite, do you have a least favorite aircraft to take a photo of? Gliders. <laughs> I mean, yeah. if, uh, if if we're being honest, um, I've I've honestly I've never been in a glider before. Um, I have no interest in flying a glider. Uh, you can't do a go around in one, and yeah. that's that's what has always made me nervous about getting into one. But um, yeah, I mean, I, but Manfred Radius flies a hell of a routine. Uh, I love watching his night show. Uh, if you've never seen him, YouTube him. One of the best glider pilots I've ever seen. Um, outside of that, I'll pretty much shoot anything, whether it's a Piper Cherokee, it's just a one seventy two. If it's got wings, if it's got rotors, I'll, I'll shoot it. Yeah. I, the, I, the one thing I don't like, though, is people, when they when they piss on general aviation, that's, for me, I understand GA isn't everybody's cup of tea, but it's the essence of aviation. Like, that's where it all began. Mm -hmm. Piston-driven propeller aircraft. And it's just, you know, you can go out to your local airport, like Nick said, and all these other guests have said, is you can go out there practice and get some really good shots but also like for me i go back to the same airport it's my favorite i actually love spotting at nampa municipal more than boise now is it takes me back to where i took my first takeoff and landing and my first solo and you know i, I get to know some of these general aviation pilots and which also pissed if you guys if you know if you're a pilot you know what i'm talking about then you get buddies with the pilots and then they let you fly their airplane potentially you know? You know? <laughs> or take pictures but, of it you know and yeah exactly they pay you for it and they get they get hours and it, yeah anyway before i i reveal my my secondary income <laughs> um, but yeah i i agree props rotors jets whatever gliders believe it or not i don't think i've actually ever taken a photo of a glider in flight before okay because I, outside an air show, I was at the air show where Dan Buchanan died in 2018, and uh, the F-22 demo was about to fly too. So I'm like, really? They, yeah. Once they brought in Life Flight from Boise, we we knew it was quite serious. Yeah. And they also the almost the base almost burned down because the pyro went off too early. And Idaho in July is quite hot and dry, believe it or not. And uh, they, the pyro went off for the TAC demo, and it almost burned the tower down. They had us in the hotshot crews and also oh <laughs> the helicopters and everything. Yeah, that was a, it was a cluster of air <laughs> show. <laughs> yeah, oh, my God. It was like, oh, mountain home. Dude, the sun is in your face for the air show. It's 120 degrees on the tarmac, but the sun in your face, it's backlit the whole entire time. I don't understand the lure of it. <laughs> it sucks. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it sucked, but... Yeah, so gliders, not the best. I understand. You know, it's I would like to fly one just to say I've done it. But, yeah, I'm in the same boat. Not really interested in, in unpowered flight. But uh, keeping it in the aviation theme, what is the rarest aircraft you have ever taken a photo of? Well, let me think. That's a good one. But 
I'll, I'll answer it in two parts because we don't get many typhoons yeah. here in the States um, or a falls. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was invited to go down to uh, Trump Base Lang Langley Usus in Virginia, and they had uh, a joint exercise. There was, uh, let's see, Raptors, F 35s, Rafals, and, uh, and Typhoons doing a joint exercise. It was during the Patrol de France uh, US tour, and they were actually there as well. Um, so I would say, from personally, rarest I've shot on the on this side of the pond would be the Rafal and the Typhoon probably Mrs. Virginia the uh, P-51A I'll, 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 I'll talk about both here in a second but uh, for those that don't know uh, Joint Base Langley is where they have the F-22s that are part of the Virginia Air Guard right? Those are active duty guys It's uh, most of Langley is the first fighter wing um, I'm pretty sure Air Combat Command is actually headquartered there. Okay, yeah. Man, were they were they the N model Rafals or were they the Air Force Rafals? Mm-hmm, yeah. Outside of the U.S. built aircraft, I love the Rafal. It is such a beautiful aircraft. It's the only airplane I've ever seen do a demo and end the demo split S into final approach. I, people don't like the Rafal. But it is one of those really capable fighters. It is designed with 4.5 fifth gen in mind. And with Canada looking at their new replacement aircraft for the their aging Hornets, I, I mean, I don't know if Dassault pulled out. I know Saab did and the Eurofighter did, but I, I hope that Canada still does closely consider the, uh, the, the Rafal. Just because for two reasons. One, seeing a Canadian Rafal be awesome and the Canadians love coming through Boise, <laughs> going down to Miramar. So. But Miss Virginia. Okay, so the if you don't know your Warbirds, Miss Virginia, outside a privately owned one, is the only A model in the world that flies. And she doesn't have a Merlin. She has an Allison in it, like the P-40. And we were lucky enough at the last Warbird Roundup, she was in Idaho for a couple months. And was really cool is remember that one Marvel TV show, uh, Agent Carter or whatever, whatever it was. If you guys have heard of it, some listeners may have or not. For the Marvel show, they wrapped the aircraft in RAF paint, so it has the RAF roundel on it. As the A model Mustang was designed for the Royal Air Force, it wasn't designed for the, for the U.S. Army Air Corps. It was designed for the Royal Air Force. So seeing that A model in actual what would have been British colors was fantastic. And this was Memorial Day 2019. So fast forward a couple months to August, and there's another A model. Well, Miss Virginia in her original scheme. So they took the wrapping off after they finished up shooting the show. So that was really cool to get both um, uh, paint wraps of Miss Virginia in person i uh i only have the u.s markings i wasn't able to get the uh, the raf ones but it she looked great i would even say that was one of my rarest catches ever too because i don't think they're going to do that again especially having an a model mustang of what would have been its original scheme as mm -hmm. well as designed for mm -hmm. but yeah but um well now that we know about the aircrafts and all that going from the 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 hornet to spot and then the mustang is your favorite and gliders being me and then you know sing this the Raphael and uh, what were the Eurofighters by the way were they uh yeah RAF? yeah they were RAF yeah that was cool to see man it's uh yeah uh, let me see the the Typhoon didn't do a demo but uh, in sequence they had uh, let's see the Patrol de France Raptor uh, then the Rafal so and it was early in the morning I think they started flying at like seven seven thirty in the morning. Um, and Langley, when they do host an air show, a fantastic light. It, the sun is at your back the entire day. Oh, wow. So if you're ever on the East Coast or Langley's having their show and we're able to get back to some sense of normalcy and go to air shows again, Hampton Roads, Virginia, Langley Air Force Base. Plus Raptors. Plus Raptors, <laughs> absolutely. Can't beat that. So what is your favorite event and or location outside of just 
spotting that you like doing oh. or go attending or, or being at or, or wherever? Um, I guess outside of aviation, um, I take a lot of pictures of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I recently launched uh, my own like personal brand of a website in addition to uh, what I have on you know, Instagram for my aviation. Uh, it has a little bit more on, on some of the other stuff that I shoot. On the aviation side, um, so I went to Thunder Over Michigan for the first time last year. Uh, loved the show. Uh, the lighting can be a little bit tricky at times, but uh, what a terrifically well ran event. Uh, the Yankee Air Museum that's, uh, that's based at Willow Run Airport in Ypsilanti, Michigan, uh, they just do a terrific job. I mean, and if you're a photographer, uh, they take care of you. Uh, for the whole weekend. Um, in addition to that, I mean, I wish I could spend two or three months a year out west. Um, I mean, you guys have there is so much cool stuff on the on the west coast, uh, whether it be low level fighters or just a variety of aircraft out there, uh, or even just the scenery. Uh, whenever I've gone out to El Centro, I like to fly into Phoenix and drive the three and a half hours from Phoenix down to SoCal. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love the scenery. Uh, I could spend oh, yeah. days just taking photos of the scenery. The southwest part of America is my favorite part of the country. I think oh, that's besides funny. my Idaho, besides my Idaho mountains. But yeah, it's like I I love the drive from Las Vegas to the Death Valley. I think it's so, it's the most gorgeous scenery on earth. And then Death Valley itself is yeah best sunsets in the world. Oh yeah, hands down. You can't beat that light. Even the sunrise light too is even yeah. amazing down there in Vegas. Oh yeah. Well, uh, let's. So, what about Oshkosh? Though, have you been to Oshkosh? I'm one of those guys to say next year. I'll go next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm one of those guys also. And you know, last year I was legitimately looking at going. Um, you know, a couple of my buddies, uh, Nick Moore and uh, Ryan Tonkosh, they have actually uh, been volunteers for EAA out there and that was something I was potentially looking at doing, uh, making a trip out to Oshkosh and doing that. And then last year COVID hit and I was like, oh, well, I'll go next year. And you know, I said, well, that's not going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just, it's, I think I can speak for, you know, every photographer that travels for uh, aviation. Uh, it's, it's hard to make travel plans. Um, so for last year and this yeah. year, it's hard to commit to anything. As it, uh, as on the flip side, it's tough for a show or an event to, to really uh, stick to anything because of uh, events outside of our control. So, I think once again this year I'll be saying I'll go next year. Yeah, one of my friends and I, we were planning on flying over there and just doing, you know, being a part of the flying itself. You know, mm-hmm. you know, unfortunately, this cost and time and it didn't work out. Unfortunately. Definitely, we're gonna get to Willow Run. That's also a cool airport too, because that's where Kalata's based, and they got all the old like seven two sevens and DC nines and the old seven four sevens out there too, right? Yeah, well, uh, last last time we were out there, let's see, uh, I think I saw four or five DC nine dash fifteens, and uh, wow, and it was great just to hear GT eights again. <laughs> oh yeah. Especially the old ones, not the newer quote quote modern ones, but the Old yeah, ones. no hush kits. No, oh, those are the best types of engines. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. Let's and you got so let's let's get to know. Let's let's talk about a spotting story. So do you have any uh, any stories that you want to share with the listener? Sure. Yeah. So uh, I think there's been a couple videos and definitely photos on this. I put it out and um, our first trip as full disc. Uh, we made a trip out to El Centro. Uh, to, uh, we were fortunate enough to be on base for a little bit of it. Uh, they had their, their air show. It's a one day air show. Um, we shot off base, on base, and on the uh, practice day, uh, one of the performers happened to be uh, VFA 106, a Rhino Demo team. They actually flew from Virginia Beach out to the West Coast. And if you haven't seen their, uh, their demo profile, uh, they do a simulated bolter or basically missing the cable with the hook and they do a low transition off of that and they stay usually pretty low and then they'll pull up like you would see like the blue angels do when they take off and the, the one solo pull straight in the air so we're sitting at the end of the runway 
uh, off the approach end of 3-0 at El Centro. And Rhino comes in, does a simulated bolter. He stays low. And he stays low. And he's getting closer and closer. And the viewfinder keeps filling up and filling up and filling up. Before you know it, he's pulling up over our heads. And just, you want to talk about a massive dust cloud and just a complete adrenaline rush. Uh, that that's a moment I will absolutely never forget. And there's there's a couple of great photos out there. Uh, James Witter captured one of uh, Ryan Tykosh and I literally right after it happened. Uh, you can barely see us, and you can barely see our car, our rental car, because of all the dust. And it had to be within five or six seconds after the jet went over us. But that's certainly a, a memory that I will never forget. I have seen videos and photos from that day. And holy crap. <laughs> I mean, how, dude, he was, what, 50 feet above your head? Uh, something like that, yeah. And God bless the guys that were uh, sitting on their motorcycle uh, in front of us because I think they were actually closer to him than, than, than we were. And they weren't phased whatsoever in the videos. <laughs> Those, well, I mean, they ride motorcycles, so they might be a little deaf, but holy crap. <laughs> Just... What was the pressure wave like off the aircraft? Did it, did it hit you right in the chest? Uh, you felt the heat more than anything. Uh, it's one of those times I think you, you, you turn to get him climbing out, but by the time that you actually turn to pull up your lens and lock it onto the, the jet, that dust cloud is already coming for you. I mean, your ears are still ringing. Uh, I had earplugs in, thank God. But... It's, it's just an adrenaline rush that you feel in your chest. You feel th throughout your bones. Um, and that's, that's hell, that's almost every takeoff from El Centro. If it's got afterburners and it takes off over you, it's a feeling like no other. Yeah, man, that's... Uh, I wish I was there that day. But they have taken those hay bales down too, right? Yeah, and, and I'm actually probably one of the few people that think that was a good idea. Um you know, there's there's a lot of people that'll actually get like the real tall ladders and stand on top of them and you know, I always look at it as, you know, when the blues are there, you know, they're they're training. We're in their way. That's how I look at it. Yeah. So I you know, I, I'm actually a proponent of them removing the hay bales just just from a safety perspective. I mean we all wanna get cool shots. We all wanna have a shot that, you know, oh I got this shot, like I can't believe I got it. Um you know, but at what cost? And yeah, and, and so you know, I think it was uh, you know much, much to everybody's chagrin. I think it was a, a good idea and a, a good tip of the cap to do that because eventually somebody would get hurt, and then it would be that road is closed. You can't go take photos there, uh, and it would just ruin the fun for everybody. It's, I mean, there are so many people like that right now that don't give a flying damn about themselves. I'm oh, sorry about others and like like the people that actually go there on a regular basis and it's so sad to see that like they don't have any sense of repercussions i am all for preserving certain locations um i mean el centro i mean yeah the hay bills being taken down is probably a good thing i know a lot of people complain about like oh i want to get that shot blah blah i'm like well if you think about it there's could be some dude down there with the rifle or something other that's more malicious and then, you know, something could really happen. And then that's gone forever. Mm -hmm. You know, it just takes one person to ruin it for everybody else. Oh, it's else. absolutely true. And, uh, and I, I worry I worry about Nellis getting to a point like that. I worry about uh, Oceana getting to a point like that where it's just going to be zero tolerance policy. Yeah, uh, it's unfortunately, it's close. There, so I have saw people running over to the fence for Nellis, uh, as we discussed with Michael Grove on the show. Don't ever, ever go to the other side of the fence. I saw one guy on the fence in his truck with his flag taking photos, and I pulled up next to him, like, get off the side of the road. And then we had some other teenagers and some other young young adults. They were shooting through the fence for the jolly pad with their cars parked, and guess who rolled up on them? Base security and Metro PD. You know, people running across the road. You, 10 feet, 20 feet will not make a difference in your photos. <laughs> they won't. They will not. You know? So play by the rules. Preserve for everybody else. 
take your kids there one day. Preserve it for the next generation of spotters. Right. Just have some professional respect for everybody else. Absolutely. You know, when people don't talk about certain things, there's probably a reason behind it. Or if you see everybody on that side of the road, doesn't mean you should go to that side. The other side, I should say. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, man, um, that's, yeah. Guys, go find YouTube for that. You, you'll find it. Don't worry. But anyway, man, let's start wrapping her up. Um... Yeah, so do you have any tips or words of encouragement for the uh, listener out there? Yeah, absolutely. On the photography side, um, never be afraid to ask questions. Um, never be afraid to try something different. Never be afraid to push yourself. Uh, be a little bit more adventurous on the uh, what you want to capture and how you envision it. Um, just because somebody has you know, 40 or 50,000 followers on Instagram and, you know, their work is a certain way. It doesn't mean you have to model their work. Let it be your own. Who cares? Followers are just followers. And I'll probably lose a couple for saying that. Uh, but I appreciate everybody that does like my work. That's one of the things that actually drives me is to how do I keep pushing myself to be different, to keep pushing out good content. My DMs are always open on Facebook, Instagram, if anybody ever has a question about whether it's gear, settings, I, I'm an open book. You know, it, it, one of the coolest things that I will ever say is one of the coolest things <laughs> that you can do is take one photo, send it to five different photographers, and you will get five completely different edits than you would expect. It's yep. everybody has an editing style, everybody has their own what their eye sees. And, and that's one of the things that I love about photography, especially when it comes to aviation. Because, oh yeah, right, yeah, there's a Viper climbing out. Okay, well, what if I rotate the photo a little bit? What if I crop it a little bit here? Cool, make it your own. You know, there's no, you have to do it this way, or you have to do it that way. Have fun, you know? Um, yeah. As far as words of encouragement, um, even on the flying side of it, you know, if you want to start to fly, Go to your local airport. Go to talk to a flight instructor. Just say, hey, you know, I want to. Uh, this is probably what I could afford. I, I want to see if I even like flying. You know, can I do a, set up an introductory flight? And they'll take you up for half an hour or so, let you fly the airplane around, saying, then this is what we would do. This is what it would be like. Just try it. You know, try everything at least once. Um, that way you can mm -hmm. see, you can walk away saying, uh, I tried it, not for me. Or, like a lot of people that get into flying, you're hooked. And you're hooked forever. What you said about being unique in yourself and followers are just followers. I mean, I appreciate everybody that follows me. I do my own thing. I don't like bending to anybody else or doing anything anybody else's way. I like being me, you know, and that's what you should always be. You should always be yourself. Never try to copy somebody else and it will pay dividends in the future. Um, and you're exactly right. You know, I think jet. I think looking the jet photos and airliners, they have such a set parameter of what you have to edit to be on their website. That's kind of ruined the artistic value of editing. Mm -hmm. It's like, like I've honestly, I've been playing a lot more with like wide angle crops and like, what if I do this and what if I do that? And I like it a lot more. You know, the artistic value of it. No, absolutely. I've gone back to work that I haven't touched in three years and found some gems and it's like, well, let me do this to it. Let me turn it, crop it a little bit like this. And, you know, we, here's the thing is that we all have this fancy editing software, right? That we either pay or we, mm -hmm. you know, free, whether it's on our phone or whatever, but we have this powerful software and applications that we use, use them, have fun with it. You know, move the slider yeah. all the way to the right. No, okay, move it back a little bit. You know, like just test it out. Have fun. That's what it's for. You're paying for it. Use it to your advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, play with it. Play with it. It's a photo. It's a digital photo. You can go back and, and revert everything back to original. And try exactly. It again. <laughs> but you. So you mentioned uh, your your DMs on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. So uh, where can the listener find your work and, and go shoot you? Yeah, DM? absolutely. So. Uh, I'm on Facebook and Instagram for my aviation. You can simply find me at Ryguy, R-Y-G-U-Y, aviation. Uh, that's for both Instagram and Facebook. And then on my 
non-aviation. Um, if you want to fo follow it, it's RCK Photo on Instagram. It's as simple as that. Uh, that, that there is where you're going to find my dog and some bald eagles and some uh. scenery stuff. But uh, Facebook and Instagram, like I said, DMs always open, always happy to talk, always happy to meet new people and uh, give some advice whenever I can. And that's what the community should be more is about building each other up and not tearing each other up. Absolutely. Down. You know, we're uh, so not many of us are making a living doing this and a lot of us it's just for fun and just the thrill of it. So just have fun, talk yeah. to people, you never know who you're gonna meet and be nice to everybody. Hey, that's I literally wanted to go stand by you with my buddy Chris and we started talking and now look. <laughs> hey, that's I and you know, one of the biggest air shows in the US. Yeah. And it's not the biggest. Yeah, and just chit-chatting, you know? It's yeah. just, oh, all right, cool. Well, you know how we had Larry um, also shoot next to us? Yeah. <laughs> well, he might be coming on the show, too. I, I sent him a DM also. Awesome. So, uh, Larry's yeah. good people. It, oh, yeah. Make sure you bring up the uh, the parking lot stories. Uh, every, time, you know, every time I run into him, man. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to write that down, so don't forget. Parking lot. Larry, I wish I did, like, a live podcast because so they can see my actually write this down <laughs> parking lots stories yeah he was he was a hoot to talk to man it was he he, he was cracking some jokes i love it so i think he's going to be great for this so oh he's going to be perfect uh, he went to thunder over michigan with us last year we uh, we got an airbnb and he stayed with us what a great guy man and he's a yeah. photographer hell of a good guy um and, and that's the other thing in this industry is that you won't really find many people that aren't willing to help you out or just be a good person you know no yeah. matter where you go there's always going to be some somebody that just wants everything for themselves and is just selfish or whatever uh, but uh, that's the good thing about this industry is we're all just trying to help each other have some fun and take good pictures of cool looking airplanes you know there's a few bad apples but hey you know everybody i think everybody will build them full is always wants to help each other out down the road no matter what absolutely so but anyway, Ryan, thank you so much for taking a, l a little over an hour out of your evening to come and talk to me on here. Um, and also, thank you to your wife. I know it's getting late over there, so thanks uh -huh. and thanks to her also. Uh, anyway, guys, this is the part of the show. I haven't said this in a while, so hopefully I can remember my spiel. If you know anybody that you think would love to come talk aviation with me here on the Aviation Spotters Podcast, please shoot me a Facebook message at the Aviation Spotters Podcast. I will be relying on Facebook here uh, for the next couple of months, very, very heavily, more than Instagram, uh, though my followers will see why here in a week or so. But please, please, please go check out the Facebook page. I will do a lot more updates on the Facebook page and shoot me a DM there. My Twitter DMs are always open at BOI Spotter and Instagram at BOI Spotter. Um, you guys shoot me a DM there and all. And like I said earlier in the episode, YouTube. Uh, for the a great tool for people that don't have Spotify, Apple, Google, uh, Stitcher, whatever, go check the go check that out. Um, the website we're we're getting there. It's <laughs> yeah, I need a I need help with that. So anyway, Ryan, anything else to add before we uh, close out for good? Keep shooting. You never know what you're gonna catch. And uh, I appreciate you having me on tonight, Colin. It was uh, it was a good conversation. Absolutely, man. It's always a great time talking with friends and. Uh, you know, reconnecting here and there. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you another air show here in the very near future. Awesome. Looking forward to it. You guys know what I always say at the very end, so keep those cameras ready and this batteries charged, and we'll catch you on another episode of the Aviation Spotters Podcast.